New York and on the new Hot 97 app, Ebro in the Morning. On Hot 97. Ladies and gentlemen, you are uh, yeah. tuned in to Ebro in the Morning. You got the beautiful Laura Styles. Rosenberg is working on his other program today because uh, we ran a little bit late. And Steve Stout jumped in my text the other day was like, yo, we got to have a discussion. So he's on the program today right. wearing his fabulous Dapper Dan custom made jacket from the Dapper How Dan. How do you know it's custom? Very luxurious. Well, you're custom. Steve Stout. And custom. that store, the new Dapper Dan store, everything is custom in there. Everything yes? is custom in that store. And, um, yep. And I'm glad you said that I hit you in text and I didn't like DM you and shit like that. Wow, DM sounds it, weird. I don't. It's weird. For, I'm still not there. Well, because like, it, it feels like a DM is just for like when you're trying random. To, like you don't know the person. Yeah, it's you're impersonal. Like, hey, yeah, how yeah. are you? Uh, I, I get weird. And when people DM me, I'm like, you have my number. Why don't you just call me or text me? People who know you DM you. Yes, yeah, so, it happens. I mean, it's strange. Oh, we got coffee for Steve Stout too. That's Trinae. Say so hi to Trinae. Hey, Trinae. Hey, doing Trinae. Pleasure. Um, so, Steve, um, first, we've been trying to get Dapper Dan on the program. I know he doesn't love to do talking interviews. He does, he, as That's what I was told. They lied to you. Oh, they did. He yeah. does crazy talking interviews. He's I'd doing, love to have Dapper Dan on his man, program. Man, you should definitely have him, and you should ask him. I've asked people uh, so many people. People need to know people. everything. I could, uh, we've done. celebrated him on the no, air, but never done. had a chance to talk to him. So... Let's start, Bing. You want to get well, into that? Well, well, I mean, obviously, you're, New, you're from Queens, New York City. Uh, you grew up here, so and you've been a part of hip-hop culture. We've interviewed you several times on the program. Uh, but the Dapper Dan store in Harlem is so culturally significant because of what Dapper Dan was doing for streetwear yeah. in the 80s, of course. right? which was not recognized by the high fashion industry. Nope. And he was, got in a lot of trouble. For customizing got into, clothes. Got, got into a lot of trouble. Um, and growing up in Queens, I would watch Run DMC, LL Cool J, Kane, Bobby Eric Brown, B, yeah. Eric B, and all the drug dealers, <laughs> right, that were famous, that everybody was actually trying to mimic and be like, we're Dapper Dan. I didn't, couldn't afford it or anything like that. I wasn't like that. And, you know, when I recently, two years ago, I was at his house on a Sunday because I, I put him in the Tanning of America documentary and I was at his house on a Sunday and this whole thing came out about like Gucci and they copied something from yeah, that. So yes. Gu Gucci did a, uh, a I, I want to say it was fall 2017 or I, no, fall it was, 2016. It was like a cruise line in 2017 and they used, the, the head designer was inspired by Dapper Dan and one of the women that, they used that that had the Dapper Dan original jacket that they were inspired by happened to be a very famous um, Olympic sprinter. Oh, wow. Know, that part did. I didn't know because we talked about it. That's how come it got out. That's what's so crazy because Diane Dixon, her last name is Dixon. Mm -hmm. She was a world-class sprinter. She ran in the Olympics. It was, it was, so she's buying Dapper Dan and she got the, yeah, jacket, the jacket like that. Big, you know. So, of course, people, that's a memorable, it's not like, Somebody that it's a somebody, statement piece. It's, yeah. a, it's a statement piece, and they used yeah. an old photo. Am I understanding well, that right? The, well, the internet d did its job. I mean, already found know. the old photo. <laughs> boom, boom. But remember, like if it was somebody that was sort of anonymous, maybe they wouldn't have easily had found a picture like that. Right. But like it's an Olympic sprinter who like bought the Dapper Dan joint, and they put they they put those photos together because not only did she have it on, they actually copied her hair as well. With the like, afro. They did the whole thing. I posted the photo at the time like, yo, Gucci, what the fuck are you doing? I was there, bro. So I'm at his house. I'm at his house that day because, I mean, love him. He's a living icon. He's a living icon, lives up in Harlem, and he's a good man. Great shape. Pleasure to speak to you. It doesn't feel like you're doing a chore. Like, you can't. It's a privilege to spend time with him. And specifically that day, to make the whole story go full circle... I was literally at Dapper's house on um, in Harlem and like right near the Red Rooster uh, the, up in Harlem as well. Right. I had a meeting that took me three weeks to set up with Cool Herc. Wow. And I was going back and forth between, and Cool Herc was late. It was like, I'm going to see Cool Herc, then go that. The Cool Herc story is crazy. And I met with Cool Herc because I was trying to get the, the Google Doodle on August 4th. Google turned their page to hip-hop with right, the turntables. Right, right, right. So I'm trying to get Cool Herc in it because, like, we need Cool Herc in it, and I'm doing it for the love. Like, I always try... Um, I always try to do something once or twice a year to take all the wisdom that I have and all of the experiences 
companies that I've worked with and do something that is specifically for the culture with no um, financial gain for myself. It almost, it, it feels like it's giving back to the thing yeah. that's done well for me. So to get Cool Herc in the Google Doodle thing was important. No one can get him. He's 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 not trustworthy of of, of many. Yeah. And I know why. And his sister runs his business. So I met with Cool Herc. That was a it was an inspiring and it was a sad experience simultaneously to see him um, in the state that he was in and have the conversations that I wanted to have with him but couldn't couldn't get there. He's just not. Um, his health is challenged. No, it's not the health. It's bitter. Mm. He was there first. Yeah. You know? It, the guy who's there, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of bitterness that goes with the guy who was there first. That's right. The guy who discovered it. It's the second and the third guy who reaped the rewards. The first guy gets acknowledged but doesn't get the trappings yeah. of it all. You know? And that's, Sort of where he where he is. So anyhow, I got that done for him, and um, his sister Cindy was amazing in getting it done, and they trusted me, and you know, it's it was it was perfect actually to have him be a part of it. And I go back to Dapper Dan. It's the other side of that spectrum. It's a guy who is a Harlem native who's been making clothes for every era of guy, the hustler. Right, the pimp, the hustler. The athlete. The, the athlete. No, but like as you go through time, it was like the pimp, then the drug dealer, right. the rapper, the athlete. Like he's gone through it. He's always made like superheroes costumes. Yeah. Like he's that guy. And to hear him tell the story on how he got shut down was crazy because um, he had the store open and 24 hours. He got Africans in there 24 hours making clothes. Whatever, Never leave the club, that. go there 24 hours, you're making clothes. Boom. Never knew that. So Mike Tyson goes up there at 4 in the morning. And this is 87? Mike Tyson had, all you need to know is it was the year Mike Tyson had beat Mitch Green. Because Mitch Green is on the other side of the park pimping and then uh, finds out that Mike is at Dapper Dan and makes reference to the fact that, you know, he beat him inside the ring, but right. he could take him in real life. Right, right. I remember that whole controversy. Mike Tyson is never runs from the smoke. The smoke goes down. Mike Tyson <laughs> does his thing. <laughs> Dapper, of course, Mike Tyson's the heavyweight champion of the world. Like, no matter how cool we are with Mike Tyson, it's Mike Tyson. To the world, he's like an iconic of course, athlete. Of course, of so, course, yeah. So he, why is Mike Tyson outside of a clothing store fighting at four in the morning. <laughs> so you know what that yeah, brings, right? Yeah. Police. Of course. And what happens when the it was police... 86, by the way. It's okay, 86. 86. So, what I, so, I mean, that's the middle of the heat, right? So what happens when the police see Louis Vuitton, oh, MCM, no. and all that? Well, I never knew this was that their fault. Yeah. It's so crazy on Monday night... On Monday night football, there's a Monday night football taping, and there was a delay. And the Goodyear blimp is flying over. And the announcer says, it's flying over New York, and it's a giant game. And he says, somewhere down there, Dapper Dan's store is open. <laughs> he says, it's on Monday Night Football. So he's that hot. Yeah. And when they come in, they, you know, they shut things down. And um, then he has to, you know, figure it out. But it ain't the same, right? He's, the store's shut down. You cut to, you know, what is it, 20 years later, 20, 21 years later? Um, there's a, there was other people inspired by him. Supreme. Yep. You go through all of yep. the clothing lines. Yep. They've been inspired all by All streetwear. Him. All streetwear. And um, when Gucci's Alessandro was inspired and, and sort of paid homage, when you look back on it, I mean, you, 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 I've done the diligence, right? It was homage. I mean, if they could have got away with it and no one said anything, it still would have been homage, but he wouldn't have got paid. Um, the internet got hip to it and wanted to make sure to Dapper it. Dan got paid. And the truth of the matter is I I knew the one guy. I knew the, the guy who who runs Gucci. I've known this guy for years. I've known him for 20, since I did the Jay-Z Reebok stuff. He was at uh, um, Armani at the time, and that's mm -hmm. when we met him. We stayed cool. And he's at Gucci now, and I called him up, 
And we sat down, we met in France, and we got it done. And, you know, Dapper's got his store open again, and the line is launching in the next few months. You're going to be able to get Dapper at any Gucci store all around the world. Wow. Plus custom and it's amazing. And, and, the, and the store story. where this comes from, long story short, I was just giving Steve a hard time in the hallway because I didn't get the invite to the to when Steve went to custom because uh, I'm sure Steve got a suit done. <laughs> no, 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 uh, just this. I just got this done. Bec the lines, I mean, Khaled's there every day. I mean, it's just too every much. Every day. Pecos and Khaled Ka there every other day. It's just too much. It's just too much. You and I ain't got me? money like that. And I love the yes, fact that do. he was able to open up his boutique on, on 125th Street yes. the way he wanted it. Because I heard that they were trying to kind of persuade him to go to like Fifth Avenue. No, 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 no. Don't that not true. No, no, no. They wanted it in Harlem. Okay. Okay. And he wanted it in Harlem. It was never, that was not even up for discussion that it gotcha. was going to be in Harlem. In fact, they actually upped the ante on the quality of the townhouse that it's in and the, where it's at. They like they found, they put the real estate people on it. Mm. They did their thing. They treated this man with ultimate respect. Oh, I love that. They treat him the way he deserves. And I've seen him go all around the world for Gucci, and it's nothing but the best for him. Like, straight up. This, this is and not, so, and basically it's not no what you're pandering. Saying is, it's not no pandering. Let me just be nice to make it look good. No. Right, right, right. No, it's, and, it's full commitment. And what you're saying... Um, and for everybody watching this is Gucci um, recognizes the value, right, of and the ingenuity and the creativity that went into creating these while at the time they weren't, um, you know, uh, they weren't being they weren't recognizing. Now they recognize the influence it had on popular culture. Yeah, man. It look. Ebro, you know, we, we talked about this years ago. I wrote about it in the Tanning of, of America, America yeah. eight years ago. I mean, I've seen it happening. And the fact of the matter is that ethnic insights dominates general market mindsets. Like, straight up, if it comes from a place that's authentic and pure, that just resourcefulness that forces you to think a certain way, people respond to that. That's, like, that's, that's actually popular. Mm -hmm. The fact that you figured out how to turn nothing to something, not only as an entrepreneur, but also like the way you put clothes together, the way you actually turned Timberlands from an outdoor hiking thing to fashion or Nordica or whatever. Or, because those fashion brands, they didn't care. They were like, if you a size four or be be bigger woman, forget it. We don't make shit for you. And if you're a guy over 150 pounds, it's forget a rut. All of a sudden, you go into Louis Vuitton, they just hide Virgil. Yep. Why they hide Virgil? You know what they're really saying? Fuck suits. This is Louis Vuitton. Well, because now people <laughs> are wearing saying, designer sweatsuits. Fuck to ties. Yeah. Fuck suits. And fuck all that button-up shirt shit. We're doing this. <laughs> yeah. This is the new luxury. It, the streets have redefined luxury. It's not what it used to be. That is, And that is hip-hop culture. We'll never, ever, ever take full responsibility in aggregate for what we've done. But we have changed fashion globally. Not, not like as a theory, it's a fact. It's a black guy, Virgil from Kanye West, running Louis Vuitton. It's like, how does this, these things happen? I mean, these are, these are phenomenons. Dapper Dan is with Gucci. Supreme is out of control. They sold for a billion dollars. Yeah. It's out of control. And that's a skateboard brand from the streets Come of New on, York. Come on, man. From the street. And you know skateboarding, graffiti, yeah. and hip-hop, yeah. and, and like break dancing. Yeah. Those are like cousins. Yeah. Like, it's those, all street culture. Of course. Now, Steve, um, you brought up Kanye. Um, how you saw the last social media, yeah. <laughs> uh, let's call it debacle. Right with Kanye, the MAGA hat, the whole thing. Yeah. Um, any opinion on what Kanye's doing, or any insight for us with regard to conversations that are being had with regard to Kanye West and the shift of culture and politics? Yeah, mom. Um, look, the good news is, when I was sixteen, I don't know about you. When you were sixteen, Laura, I don't know about you, but whatever that era was, politics wasn't something that I responded to. It did. I didn't feel like my vote would matter. I didn't feel like my voice mattered. It wasn't a thing 
that I um, took in right, as a part of. And now, because of what's taking place with the presidency and this guy in office and all the talk around it, you got young people who are stepping up that you know are going to be politicians, that are going to be activists, that are going to be the next leaders. And they're focused on it. You know, from 13 up. It's cool now. It's, it's cool. very cool. And that, that that's awesome because there's going to be some great people, great leaders that come out of it. So that's the unintended effect, I believe, of the president we currently got in. And, and, and the celebrity aspect of it, which he is a celebrity. I mean, at the end of the day, he's a celebrity. And, and I look at it not only as like Trump being the president, and I go, wow, like how did he do that? But it's like Arnold Schwarzenegger was the, the right. governor. governor. And that, that doesn't mean he, he's, I don't know, it's funny, but he's like, I didn't know he was American until he became the governor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> did yeah, you? No. Yeah, right. And then like, I grew up watching wrestling and like Jesse the Body Ventura. He's a governor. As, it's, so Ronald it's, Reagan was an actor. I was in so, the 80s. So know. it's not like we never seen this, right? Yeah. So this guy does it. And, you know, Kanye, Steve Harvey, the champ, Mayweather, they all went up there. Yeah, I was I, I called them. Hey, listen, they got they all mad at me. I called them all cooning for cash because I knew what they was trying to do. They was trying to align themselves them, them. with that pocket. It's with not that worth money. it. It's not worth the money's not worth it. They don't even need the money. And it's not worth it. Um I and I my, I'm a big believer of I don't care about, I will tell you this. I'm I'm not a believer of Republican or Democrats or any of that. I think that's bullshit. I'm a registered independent. Okay. I'd say that all the time to make you sure vote, people know I they vote, don't have to pick a side. Yeah. It, and it's, I feel the same way about religion, man. You you vote, you believe in your God, you vote for the candidate that you believe mirrors your values, right. that you feel is going to do the best around the things that you believe in. So I don't believe in those. Um, they're like gangs, man. <laughs> they're like organized gangs. Like the Democrats, they got their crew, they, like, and they run it just like that. Um, so I'm not down with that. What Ye did... From one side of it, as an artist, I could see him really pushing hard to say, I believe in free thought so much. Look at this. I believe in free thought. And I get that. I understand that. The thing that was alarming to me was the 400 years of slavery being an option. That was like, they, I didn't, there was no art in that part. Yeah. Right? So um, if you want to wear the hot hat for shock value or a kilt for shock value or look at those pictures they took in Paris years ago. They were all walking around with tight pants, leopard pit. Everybody was looking at them like, what are you doing? Right. right. There was a, there was a shock value in it all. So it's not like he doesn't do that. But when he said that, I didn't understand that. That's uh, out of everything he did. That's the thing I didn't, I didn't understand. And I can't, I can't, I can't align to that. Like, 400 years of slavery seems like a choice. Like that, 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 and he's a friend of mine. Um, that's the only thing that I, from that, when I look at the debacle. Did you talk, did you call him? Did you? Yeah, I spoke to him. I spoke to him. I, I spoke to him about the whole point of being about like, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, like that part don't matter. I don't, like, forget all of that stuff. And by the way, and I, we've said it for weeks and weeks and weeks, as soon as he came yeah. out of his mouth, I was like, guys, black Republicans, black people being Republicans is not a new phenomenon. Right. Do no. not allow people to make you think that that is a new concept. It is not a new it's concept. It's not a new concept. In fact, here it is, Ebro. Those, they switched their values. Yes. They, and I said this, Republicans literally were the ones, whether you, why they did it and they're intent on doing it, they were the ones who freed the slaves. Yes. Abraham Lincoln was Republican. You may not like that, but that's the truth. And the Democrats were supporting the white supremacists. Yes. That's a fact. They switched. Then the Democrats started supporting African civil Americans rights. and the right, civil right. rights. And then the and Republicans. And racist said, Democrats and, was like, we're not fucking with that. We're and, switching to and Republicans. And they switched sides. And this is the reason why you can't pick them. Forget those words. Those words are meaningless. You pick a person you, based on their values, and if their values align with yours, then that's cool. You know, and that to me, it should always have been that. The fact that they segregate people and put them in like, whether you're doing that or that, that's, that's mental, that's slavery. It's for you to align yourself with a party regardless 
of what leaves that person's mouth, that's not free thought. You helped me years ago when you put out the book Tanning of America and you were up here for it. And if anybody watching this did not read that book, it's an awesome book and we're living in it right now. That's right. Thank you. Um, the concept of urban, it always bothered me. I hated it. Right? I hated working at a record company and you work in the urban division. I hated I'm it. I'm like, what the fuck is that? Well, it's it's geographic. It's not it's not about people, right? It's urban, suburban, rural, <laughs> right? And so because people, and mostly at record labels and at radio and media, were afraid to say black because black came with stigma. It came with yeah. advertisers not wanting to pay a Speak certain on rate, it. Speak right? On it. And so people ran from the term black. And so... Steve put out this book, Tanning of America, and the fir first thing, first page, he gets right to this. And I was like, yes! Finally, somebody is saying what I've been feeling my it's whole so life weird. in radio. And radio is, radio is fucked up. And I spoke to um, the other guys, the head of the other... iHeart. iHeart. Yeah. About this thing. I'm like, the worst shit of all time in radio, the most fucked up scam of all time was the word Churban. Churban. Crossover For Urban. urban? What is that? C crossover urban. Urban acts, black acts. Who are acceptable to the mainstream. People, yeah, they, and, they, and they call those stations churban stations. That sounds insane. Hot 90, no. Hot 97, Wait, I've never heard this term Hot 97 was a churban station. They <laughs> yes. got rid of it. Hot they call it crossover now. Yeah. Power 106, Churban so Stations. So one of the biggest arguments that I've always had in this it's industry where shit. black people be so mad at me. Oh and they did it for advertisers. They go yeah. to an advertiser and go, it's black, but... The reach is big because it's Cherbin. And they charge against it. And I'm like, that's the craziest shit of all yes. time. Inside of a record company, I, I was at Sony. I remember Destiny's Child was a black act. Yes. Then all of a sudden they got big and they became a pop act. So the pop staff worked on it and the pop guys got bonus off of it and they just left. And and so all of the staff that worked this up, and yeah. made this popular saw no bonus or no Nothing. incentive based on this group becoming popular. I see. I remember looking at that, and it's happened a thousand times. But I remember that one specifically because, like, they really started as a black act, and they right. were they were coming out the gate, and it was the be early beginnings of growing their audience. And then as soon as it took off, it was like, oh, we got this now. Well, why? I thought they were black. No. Well, and it's ba pop. and here's what it's based in. What it's based in is oftentimes black acts, hip hop acts, wanting to be accepted over there. So they don't want a certain title because that title is associated to the others, the whites and mainstreams, as something that only black people love, right, or digest, which is just not true. As if white folks don't like R and B, it was never or white true. folks don't like hip hop, it was never or white true. folks. And even furthermore, I, I did a, I put a tweet up last week because I'm working on something behind the scenes, and I said, "What do y'all prefer these days?" Let me see if I can find it. I put oh, yeah, up, yeah, I yeah, put I up. That. Do you like the term urban music, or do you like the term black music? And I put up a poll on my page because I wanted to know kind of where people's mind. Oh, I still have it up there. It's still, it's been up there for six days. What'd you find out? I said, as far as titles for music Results departments and categories are concerned, what label do you prefer? Urban music or black music? 54% prefer black music. 46% prefer urban music. Yeah. But urban music means nothing culturally. Urban music means that it's playing in big cities that are dense with people. So therefore, um, there's a lot of spillover, right? Like if you live in an urban environment, then you're going to be exposed to five or six different types of music because that environment is mixed with five or six cultures. Cultures, So therefore, they're, that's how a lot of food got like that, right? Like pizza and Chinese food. They were putting in urban areas that's, and people just started eating it. Then Pizza was nothing more than like Jamaican food. It was for <laughs> yeah. a certain... And then all right. of a sudden, when they put them in neighborhoods where other people could partake in it, then all of a sudden, like, I like pizza and you like pizza and you like pizza. Same thing with music. If you put it in areas in which people can get a chance to taste it and be a part of it, then you'll find that you have new audiences. 
And, well, and the reason I bring that, I that bring makes that total up. Sense, right? No, it makes total sense. It just what, what the first thing that popped into my head is like, are people really scared to say black well, music? And I'm say, I'm glad you said scared because yes, people yes. are scared to say. They black don't know music what the right word is because they're scared that it does it automatically mean they can't be a part well, of it. Well, yes. Because some people think when you say black music, now all of a sudden white people can't make black music. Yes, you can. It's been happening forever. Michael McDonald. It's been happening for Joe Cocker. Even Elvis Presley. It's it's been happening. <laughs> yeah. Right. And and so now fast forward, we live in this PC world where people are afraid of the tanning of America, which is where I was trying to get to with one a conspiracy that I have that I talk about, which is the fear, right, that we're living in a time where what we're seeing with Trumpism and the MAGA maniacs is this fear that, um, I guess, white culture, which well, I don't even know what that is. That's not a thing. You know, if you ask white people, I knew before, maybe, definitely before Trump, if you start asking people, like, do they identify with being white? They'd be like, nah, I'm Irish. Nah, I'm... Right. But when it was in the 60s and the 50s, Everybody wanted to be white because all you wanted to do was not was be black. Was not be black. Hispanics were counted as white people on the census forms. Still are yeah, sometimes. Some are. Well, there's a box for them. They yep. didn't even have a box back then. I mean, nobody wants to be other, right? <laughs> so forget yeah. that part. Um, but like Hispanics were counted as white. Or Hispanic of black descent now. Now there's yeah. a little yeah. box like that. So anyhow. They count North Africans as white. You know that still. I don't think they knew how to define white. Well, they didn't. They made it up. It's not a thing. Yeah. It's that's why I said it's white culture is not a thing. Like people will say, yo, Ebro, your mom's white. You don't celebrate white culture. I'd be like, what are you talking about? I went to Passover, right? My mom was white, that's Jewish. I'm wearing my vans, that's skateboarding, <laughs> right? I got my Ford F-150 out front up lifted with the four-wheel drive. That's some yeah. white American culture. That's all yeah. white stuff. Yeah. Now, if you're talking about German or Irish exactly. or British yeah. or, you know, Swedish or, you know what I mean, whatever, Danish, I'm not of those cultures. So I don't know them. Right? right, and I think that's where people get confused. Well, I don't know why people running from the word black. It's almost like, do you say black or African American? Like you, you, I see white people struggle with that. Like, do I say black, African American? Ah, uh, I'd rather say urban. They just run from it because they don't know if that means something deeper from a labeling standpoint mm. what does it mean when you say somebody's black what do you mean when you say somebody's african-american how do you want me to refer to you i've seen those things take place and it's still unsettling um that poll that you put out is cool i don't know what it's unfortunate you don't know the people who are voting actually what descent they are right, right. that'd be really good if you i know i got 1300 that. votes but 1, i don't know I could votes. Go, you can't yeah. know that they could all be puerto rican right, right? what do we know right, right. whatever that means the fact of the matter is, it's becoming clearer and clearer that people should relate to each other based off of shared values. That's right. If I like skateboarding and you like skateboarding, that's what we like. It doesn't make a difference if I'm black, white, or Danish, or Spanish, Dominican, who cares? And those things, the same way I said Republicans and Democrats, those things don't mean anything. I believe that race doesn't mean anything. It should not mean anything. culture means something Co well, cultures culture should mean something yes those are shared values yes. right but defining someone's culture by their race is racism mm -hmm. like just looking at somebody and going oh he's definitely don't have a ford f-150 because he's black like what are you talking about that's exactly what he's had in fact this is the new he just updated this i just got to yeah they're they about got to the drop to 2018 that yeah. raptor's fire out here yeah son. so these are all these <laughs> the, these are all the the labels the labels at uh, defining us the labels at radio mm -hmm. all media those things are all made up in order to keep people segregated in fact in in the um i'll give you a little lesson here uh, maybe you know this but in oh you may know it as well in the, in the 60s and the 50s, you listen to AM radio, they would play everything. Mm -hmm. Like, they'd go right from... Top 40. Yeah, they'd go whatever right from... Whatever was popular. The, whatever was popular, right, they'd right, play right. it in a row. So you'd go from Sam Cooke to the Beatles to, like, they'd just play it. And FM radio literally is technology. They knew how to split a signal. FM technology was a way to split signals. So you could actually split a signal, and on the same dial... 
put multiple stations. That's why the FM has much more stations than AM because they could split it and get good, clear um, sound. Almost like the internet, literally. Almost like cable. The same mm-hmm. t- idea. So when they got that idea, what they did was, oh, we can create multiple stations. And that's and the only way to create multiple stations to get multiple revenue streams is to segregate black, this gospel, this, that. So all of a sudden it went from this, all the music that you liked in a row, whether it came from a black artist, a white artist, or whoever. It was just what was popping to these segregated channels, like segregated stations, mm-hmm. like segregated magazines, like segregated everything. And that was a way to basically charge media brands money in order to reach these niche audiences. So that, in in a weird respect, advertising incentivized people being segregated. And you're, you're, you've worked in and around advertising for a long time, and one of the things I talk about on the radio, which I know media does not get into out of fear of losing advertisers, because that's how the business is run, is how advertising controls a lot of the messages. Everything. And a lot of the things you either see or don't see is based on that outlet's ability to generate revenue around it. That's right. And so if you don't think you're hearing enough diverse voices, whatever, it's because they couldn't figure out a way to monetize those diverse voices, and you should be looking at those advertisers for not wanting to spend enough money with diverse voices. In fact, I've seen it in New York. I watched these stations flip like crazy because of it. Like, Z100 was playing. They were fine with Britney Spears and the Backstreet Boys and NSYNC and a little Michael Bolton. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, the advertisers was like, we want young people. Mm -hmm. And they listening to um, uh, Juvenile, Back That Ass Up, and and Jay-Z, Big Pimpin', and... Nelly, like... And that was when Hot 97 in the 90s was strong. Right. And Hot 97 was playing it, and they were playing that, and it was like this. Then I started looking at Hot 97's playlist. Steve Smith. And ratings. And, and ratings, and started taking that stuff, because they're like, we need these young people. This is active. And, and it's all driven by advertising money. Like, if we don't have young people, if, we don't, if we're not rolling, we lose advertisers. And the fact of the matter is, that is... I don't want to say it's the sad truth because it gives gives a lot of people's jobs. It pays a lot of bills. But at the same time, it definitely helps put out the message that these things are separated. And like you got to, this is the this station and this is the this magazine and this is the that. And I think that that, that's an antiquated model. There's no black section on Facebook. And it's interesting the way things. the like, way it's marketed, just, though, because it makes you feel like, oh, it's catered to you, to your needs, what you want. You see people like you. What's catered to your needs is the fact that you like a lot of different things. Right, right, right. You like a lot of you like a lot of different food. You like a lot of different style of, of clothing. Course, but do of you course. like? A, but there is value in a specialist. Yes, there is value in something that's specialized. Yeah, specialized in a culture. Yes, but not not spe- a race box. Not a. Ra- like, how many times have you gone out and you listen to, like, it could be great, great hip-hop music or great R&B music, and then you hear a record, like, from an artist that's a white artist in the mix of that, and you're like, oh, that's my shit. Yeah, of course. And you think, that's, like, that's that's dope. It, you didn't, you never thought about it, like, oh, he's white, I got to stop dancing. You just thought about it like it worked within the, the sound architecture yes. of what I'm listening to. Yes. Well, hip hop brought a lot of this. Like, and I, I, I would have these debates with people often about, you know, people would say, "Well, hip hop is black music," and I would say, "Yes, it is, but it is also consumed by a wide variety of people, not just black people listen to hip hop music. The biggest consumers of hip hop music, as you can see, even today, and this was back in the '90s and even in the '80s, the biggest consumer of it is not black folks. Be, be, just because the math doesn't even the make math sense. Don't make sense, but. But hip hop is black music, and rock and roll is black music. That's right. And and R and B is black music, and like it's all black music. That's in right. In fact, so I don't know what the fuck's not black music. Maybe like the ukulele, the kid, or the the, the, the Walmart. Not kid. even that. Even yeah. that. That's blues based. Yeah, that's that's blues based. So like, what what's not black music? Like, music is black. Period. And it's uh, um it's articulated by 
different people of different races, right? So there's black guys doing it. There's white guys interpreting it and doing it. Nobody's mad at, nobody was mad at Eminem. No one's mad at Logic. No one's mad at, it's, that's the best thing that hip hop did was that it did not, for all of the things that were, um, that judged it. In fact, black radio stations were the ones that weren't playing hip hop. We talk, I, bruh. They were the ones saying, we don't play hip hop here. Yeah, like because they, the, they, the, they, were, the, they were promoting the fact that they didn't play hip hop because they didn't want to lose advertisers over that street. junky, shitty music. And the fact of the matter is, all of the other stations was like, cool, we'll play it because we get audience. And you know what? We're selling advertisers' audience. You guys are too concerned about the wrong shit. Even in New York, that old, the BLS, whatever they were, yeah. they, they weren't playing right. You think, no, Kiss FM playing. played it. Kiss FM went there, went there farther first. Yeah. So anyhow, we could talk about this for hours and days, that specific topic. Um, but the truth of the matter is, going back to Dapper Dan, hip-hop culture never fails has opened the door for many. And it's a global culture. And we all we do is see evidence of it every single day, the way it manifests itself. And we should all be proud. You should be proud. You should all be proud of the role that you've played in it because it's a phenomenon that we got a chance to live. What? It's, yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. It's the Roman Coliseum. It's like a it's like one of those types of one of those types of things. It's like it's like being alive during the civil rights movement. Do you see what you're doing with your uh, company, United Masters, That's right? Tough. Yeah. Um, you've, throughout the years, whether it was working inside of a record label or starting your advertising business, right, providing tools, whether they be revenue from an advertiser in that relationship when you did the Reebok deals or uh, when you did the McDonald's deal or when you did, uh, I think you did, you know, uh, even highlighting athletes in a different way with Chris Paul and, and LeBron and yeah. the State Farm ads and uh, creating Made in America yeah. with Hove and these things that you've done, you've always provided the tools, right? Yeah. Um, and, and the finances and the way to create revenue. Is that what you see United Masters as, as, a, as a way to create tools for artists? I've always believed fundamentally, and I can articulate it much better now than I ever could, that we never, or artists never, got, there was no way to measure cultural impact, mm -hmm. cultural currency. So no matter how big you were, if it was not, you couldn't measure it, somebody who had pop ratings or a bigger score or more popularity would get the money, but the person who actually influenced the way you wear your jeans cut your hair, um, the ebonics, the language that you use, they would never make the money. It's the person who was the famous person, the most famous that would make the money. And I never understood that. And I really got a sense of it when I was first started trying to take Jay-Z in 2001, 2002 to brands. And they were looking at him like, well, we can, let's just go for the most famous person, not necessarily. And I'm sitting there going, he is the most famous, not necessarily in popularity, but in the impact of driving trends. That's the business you're in. But you could never measure that. So when you fast forward now that the music is all digital, the culture is digital, you can measure it. And all I want to do is be able to get artists. I don't care if you have 30,000 fans or you have 2 million fans to be able to monetize exactly what your value is. And at a record company, if you sell 30,000 records or something, you're garbage. You're washed. If you have 30,000 fans on Twitch, you made a great living. Yeah. You have 30,000 fans in other industries, you're doing fine. If you sell 30,000 scarves, you're eating. Why in the music business when you make 30,000 fans, you're broke? Mm. That's because you don't have direct access to your fans. And the record company structure never allowed for artists to actually know who their fans are. And that was because, A, there was, back in the day, they were record stores, so you never actually could find the person. But B, if artists knew who their fans were, would they ever sign with a record company? Mm. Why would you sign? If you know who your fans are, why would you sign with anybody? You'd go direct. So United Masters is all about signing yourself. Go direct to your fans. And we've built the engineering tools so we could actually identify the people 
who are listening to your music and then allow you to go direct to them. To me, that's the ultimate way to unlock, turn cultural currency into financial currency. And, that's, and, and that's it's my job. like I pointed out, it's a tool, right? It's, a, it's another tool to help people advance their business. I, it's the, it, to me, it's, it's the manifestation of everything that I've done. It's the manifestation of growing up in the record business early on since 91 and then moving to the advertising business in 2003 and pulling those things together. It's 25 years of my life. And I know for a fact that that's where the world is going. You've seen it since the first time I started talking about it. Artists are saying, I don't want to be with a record company. That's right. yeah, they all are it. running to be independent. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's step one. How do you then turn that independence into maximum financial gain? If you know who the people are who are streaming your music, yeah, you could stream music, you get paid directly without being with a label, and you could definitely do shows. That ain't the money. When you actually know who the person is, could you imagine if Kanye, and we can get back to Kanye or move off to Kanye, <laughs> but Kanye is an example for this right now. If everyone who listened to Fade, if he knew who listened to Fade, that he could sell them the Yeezys directly, would he need Adidas? Go direct. You know how much money he'd make? You know how much money anyone would make if they knew how to go direct to consumer based off the fact that they, the gaming companies do it. Yep. You play a game a bunch of times, they know exactly when to sell you the virtual hammer. You just play Temple Run all these times, we're definitely going to hit you with <laughs> free life for, for X amount of dollars yeah. or 50 cent. And they monetize it, right? Because they know you're deeply engaged. If you listen to a song 50 times, you're deeply engaged. That's right. You definitely want the ticket. You definitely want... And especially if you spent two hundred fifty dollars on a ticket and some merch and this and that, I'm sure you're gonna spend another forty dollars on. Of course you are. You love. You're in love with the brand. Yeah. You're in love with the brand. And 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 the pros and cons of the digital economy is supposed to be the distribution of value. That's the pros. Like the value goes, the consumer gets the best price, and the value shift to the person who drives the most value to that equation. That is the artist today. That is not getting it in a tower record store, making vinyl or making a cassette or making a CD and shipping it. No, those things are not necessarily the value anymore. The value is the artist to create a fan base and then be able to go direct to the consumer. And that is that needs to be operationalized. There should be thousands of Chance the Rappers. Thousands. Is that not, not, not as famous as Chance the Rapper, the business model of Chance the Rapper. Is that is that what prompted you to text me the other day like, yo, we need to talk because you were talking to me about songs getting pulled from streaming services. That's a great... And, and, you, and you, you have gotten great. That fucking segue was outrageous, bro. <laughs> that was good. You got to be able to see the that whole thing. Awesome. You got to see the awesome. whole thing. I like how you did that. But is that what, yeah. pro is that what the thing was? It was like, wait, so these services who people consume content on these services are now telling you what they don't want you to consume on their service? I don't, I, I don't even know your point of view on this. I'd love to hear your point of view on this. But when I seen um, XXX Tentacion, yeah. is that how you say his name? Yeah, XXX, XXX Tentacion. Tentacion. XXX Tentacion and uh, R. Kelly get pulled off a playlist on Spotify. I I thought at that moment in time, where does this go? Because if you really, are you doing it because it's, are they convenient or is this policy? It's convenient all the way. All that's, the way. That's the problem. Don't do anything. You want to be happy or you want to be right? Don't be, that's happy. Like, oh, we, we muted R. Kelly. But what's the policy? If the policy is this violent acts or hatred lyrics or you know they've they've written some description around it and it's actually unfortunate that Spotify now is getting all the they're now the the guy standing in front of all of this when other streaming services have followed suit do you don't we always separate the art from the artist haven't we always done that so if you're going to make it a policy then i have to start going through the list right and it's now it's not convenient because now we got to be like, how about this? We're fucking not playing Michael Jackson. I know. I mean, we're just not because, you know, R. Kelly shit is fucked up. And I don't fuck with R. Kelly. 
I've known him for many, many years. No, I don't fuck with him. He's either. not a great guy. Nah. But I and I don't want to. I'm not defending him. I'm defending the point. I'm defending what I believe is right. You got to separate the art from the artist. We always had, even after R. Kelly did that shit, he put out the Step Ignition the remix. Love and and Ignition remix, shit. and everybody was right there. Still not fucking with him, but appreciating the art. Look, there's people right now with Kanye West, they're not fucking with him. That album comes out, whatever Kanye West is going to put out, they're going to listen to that album, but never go to a show, never buy a sneaker. Unless he drops those MAGA bars, and I don't know. <laughs> and the, me the message is confusing, I don't know about that. But no, yeah, then people, but people have already streamed it once <laughs> right, right, to get right. the message, right. and then have decided, you know, well, we got, we got If we're going to do that, we got to go a long way. We got... A lot of well, no, artists to pull down. We got a me, lot of but, artists to pull down. But that's what that's what X uh, X X X Tentacion's team did. They had they had a list of artists, and it's the truth though, because it's how are you going to be conveniently choosing ones that are popular about, at the moment? I mean, Tupac got convicted of rape. Yeah, yeah. We got to pull him down. Chris Brown. Yes. We got to pull him down. Well, and now so here's the other thing. No, no. Let me ask you: Are they saying from the playlist or from the service? No, it's from the playlist. They're saying from they're saying from the playlist. But even if you go on the playlist, there's other artists that did the same shit that are on playlists. Well, then you you fucking up, man. I in I started obviously I got fucking captivated by this point, and Guns and Roses has a song called One in a Million, bro. It's on the playlist. If you read the lyrics to this, it's a fucking. You may love Guns and Roses, and this will make you hate them. It's an EP they put out in '88, and the song called. One in a million. If you read the lyrics right now, pull up one in a million, Guns N' Roses. Is this where Axel was on his nigga this and nigga that? And gay shit and fuck them. One in a million. One in a million. Not the not the beautiful I know, I know. song. Here we go. One, two, one, two, three, four. Yes, indeed. So I thumbed it on oh, no, so, you know, maybe Greyhound get in my way. Police and niggers. That's right. Get out of my way. Don't need to buy none of your gold chains today. Now don't need no braces. Clamped and running my neck. Uh, just need you. Know, I won't give you some slack. So boom. You're one in a million. Yeah, that's what you are. You're one in a million. Shoot a star. But immigrants and f faggots. Oh. This is your. This is one of they your. They make favorite. no sense to me. They come to our country and all they think they can do is they please. I think Trump listened to this song a few times before he started doing his thing. So anyhow, you're pissed right now. Well, no, because I remember I I liked uh, what was the first album, Appetite for Destruction, yeah. right? As a kid, yeah. Um, I I like that album and I like these songs, but I remember this moment in time because Slash, the the bass player or guitarist, mm -hmm. is half black. And he had a problem. Like, it was a problem. Like, he had to, he came out, was, and him and, I think this is one of, maybe one of the reasons the group. No, they, were, no, they, no, they broke up after this. This was after so that. So his problem wasn't that much of a problem. It wasn't that problem, much yeah. of a problem. Yeah, they the got time. big after that. Yeah. Got it, got it, got it. Yeah. So anyhow, my point is, what about that? Now, let's go one step further. Do we not play Kobe Bryant highlights on ESPN? Right. Do we not... Do we pull Dr. Dre? Do we not cover Mike Tyson? Right. Is it policy or is it convenient? That's the problem. That's the problem with all of this. And that's, like, you got to separate the art from the artist. Period. Like, and I understand the movements, and believe me, I don't think, I am not condoning anything that these guys did or are accused of. That's wrong. But when you have media companies like Spotify or Apple, whoever it is, being the judge and the jury and then taking action? Well, here's what for, happens. By the way, for guys that weren't even convicted? Right, but well, there's that part, and I think also this is the other part, and Laura's heard me say this multiple times. Um, you know, as these companies uh, publicly traded, they got to be concerned about stockholders, these movements happen, these hashtags happen, right? Uh, shareholders start getting afraid, yep. for, and they start to sell their overreact. stocks. Overreact, and they over and, and they it react. becomes and it becomes an overreaction and an overcorrection, and overreactions and overcorrections. And I know even when Chris Brown has his incident with Rihanna, there are stations that even to this day they don't support Chris That's Brown, right. right? And at the time, we we took a role that we weren't going to play Chris Brown until that whole thing was ironed out. 
And then we went on to support Chris Brown after he went through whatever programs yeah. he was going through, and we went on. But during that time where he was charged and, you know, and uh, had those issues, we stepped back and then we continued on, right? Um, and I think that was a responsible way to handle it. We didn't completely remove him at this point. He's performed on Summer Jam this many times. And there's still people who are like, how dare you? And it's kind of like, well, he made it. He, he served his debt. He did what he had to do to the court and whatever, and, and he's moved on. In these scenarios, these people haven't even been convicted. I don't even, that's what I'm trying to figure out. If you, you can't even write the policy, it's almost, that's the part about it that's not fair. If you're gonna, if you're gonna really do it and you really do it, then we, all we would be is like, yo, you know what? Until you're, you're guilty until proven innocent. That's, that's, that's Spotify's point of view on it. And, they're not supporting Michael Jackson, Pac, this guy, that guy, and the third. Wow. Those guys are really drawing the line. That's hardcore. They're not doing that. They're being selective because their policy is not really a policy. And are, are you asserting that this policy or this move is convenient marketing? Is that what you're saying? No, 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 no. It's convenient. You know, kicking R. Kelly right now, how easy is that? He don't have a hit. You don't need him for business. You don't need him to show up. You don't. You don't give a shit. So it doesn't matter. It, look, look, they're not going after the big guys. Nobody wants to go after the big guys. That's the part. That's they don't want to fuck up Michael Jackson's legacy. They don't want to be. The, you don't want to be the person saying, "I fuck." Don't fuck up Michael Jackson. We don't play Michael Jackson. You don't want to do. It's worth too much money. It's too valuable. You don't want to do that. God forbid you say that about Tupac or. I don't want to fuck with Dr. Dre. He's a billionaire. You don't want to say that. They're not convenient. And that's the reason why you can't make a policy like that. Because the policy is built on convenience. It's not built on a fact. And we don't like that. We don't like that in anything we do. We don't of like it when not. they do it to us. That's not. why we don't fuck with stop and frisk. We don't fuck with anything that's built, that's built for, it's a policy, but built for interpretation. Well, look, I've Who the gone, fuck wants to do with that? Listen, I've gone on the record with the R. Kelly thing for years. So it hasn't that, you know, I don't think his, his music should be yanked from uh, people being able to consume it. I'm just not going to play it, right? Mm -hmm. um, or interview him or anything like that. The XXX Tentacion kit, same shit. But, okay, you like that, but you love Kobe Bryant. I like Kobe Bryant. No, play for the Kobe. Lakers. Yeah, you love Kobe Bryant. Okay, you like Kobe Bryant. For some reason, you separate those two things. Well, but I think it comes down to, like, the conviction and the whole... I think at that point, like, for instance, even during the Chris Brown shit, I was like, yo, my man, he's a, he's somebody I considered a friend at the time. What the fuck is wrong with you? You're tripping. Mm -hmm. You got to hold this L. Like, the, even... Uh, I'm trying to think of someone else I know that fucking is uh, out here tripping. Um, but even we don't we don't uh, we're not fans of uh, Takashi Six Nine because he perpetuates this gang culture, which right? He's, which but I they're think like, is fake and but fraudulent. you you play a YG or a Nipsey or a mm -hmm. Snoop Dogg and you're okay with it? Yeah, because I know them and I know that that's their life. That's their lifestyle. So I just never believed Takashi and I didn't like the records and I think he's being a dick on purpose. Where I see YG or Nipsey Hussle actually really trying right. to do well, well, you like positive right. change and auth authenticity. You like authentic things. Period. If something is authentic. It has a special place to, with you. Yeah. Period. And that's why you don't fuck with Takashi because he's copying something that you don't believe is coming from a pure place. Yeah. And you don't fuck with shit like that anyway. That's 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 clear. What's not clear, not with you, but just in general, is when you decide that you're gonna make something of matter of fact, but the matter of fact is a slippery slope that's left for interpretation. When you do that in your media company. And artists rely on you as a source of distribution and promotion. And you do that. Nobody knows when their number's going to be called. No one knows when you decide it's you next. Pretty much. Because they've been, they're using it as a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah. So it's their, they're basically saying we that's reserve... What they, that's what police say, the black yeah. people. They're saying, you're saying it's a, it's a, we reserve the right to ban anyone or relegate somebody well, from our playlist. he has a hat on, so he's definitely doing... Something that's no good. No, that's not a hat. That's a hoodie. What the fuck are you talking about? Yeah. He has a suit on. He's fine. That's bullshit. We don't like policy like that. But this is no different than that policy. Right. Steve Stout, ladies and gentlemen. So where does this go? Do you think this hurts Spotify? 
No, I don't know if it. I don't know if it hurts them, um, because the artists that they picked on, that they chose. There's there's not going to be too much collateral damage from and that. And there was a there was, a, was there if, was a new public kind of a blowback against R. Kelly recently too with these women and uh, times and up. Was, and they hit him with a time. They hit him with times up. Yeah, and and look, that's all fine. I and that is that is fine. And for all I'm for all I know, based off of this videotape that I had seen back in the days, it's deserved for women to feel like this man. Is X Y Z? I understand. I'm trying to figure out how a public company is going to convict a guy who's not being convicted. That's the only thing. I'm not people behind a hashtag is all over. We They're can start a hashtag right now. That's what the fuck is for, right? To bring a group of people together that believe in a hashtag. The hashtag could be Throwback Thursday. Yeah. <laughs> that could be whatever it is. We all believe in Throwback Thursdays. Let's throw up our photo. That's one thing. But a public company deciding, ah, that hashtag equals pull down R. Kelly because we don't want them standing in front of our office or making phone calls to our stockholders and shareholders. Now, all of a sudden, you're playing a dangerous game because now you're in the spot. Because they're going to do it to somebody who is valuable to you. And what are you going to do then? Reveal that your policy is bullshit? No. You're going to be caught in a bad spot. That's why you just separate the art from the artist. It's just, it's, it's not your, you're, you're a vehicle. I mean, just stay out the way. It's, you just stay out the way. It's not your, it's not your case to ju- to be the jury over. Let the ju- if Now, if he gets convicted in the court of law, that can go against, that's a clear policy. We don't support criminal, da 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 We would all go like, yeah, that makes sense. That's cool. This one isn't right. But the Time's Up movement and women and men and people who come together to stand behind something they believe in, that's per- that's that's actually a positive thing. That's what's supposed to be happening. That's what's supposed to be happening. Ladies and gentlemen, this is uh, Steve Stout. Uh, you can look up his resume and see everything that he's uh, accomplished on behalf of hip-hop and business in general. Um, he wears amazing custom Dapper Dan <laughs> jackets um, and doesn't invite uh, his friends no, to join him cool, in the I... design of the Dapper Dan at the Dapper Dan gathering at 125th Street. I appreciate the uh, the opportunity to come up here. I actually appreciate the fact that I can just hit you and come up here and share my point of view like that. I don't take things like this for granted. Oh, it's love. I, I just don't. I don't. I don't take it for granted. Um, the fact of the matter is that this is important to me. Um, I think that censorship without somebody being convicted of crime, I think. I don't want it to happen to me. I don't want it to happen to you. I don't think it should happen um, because we we don't we don't we don't agree with it as a policy at, at all. So I don't want to see us just sit there and conveniently agree with this because well, it's R. Kelly. We live in a time where people are rushing to convict somebody even before courts. That's the time we live in, right? Uh, even with um, with the uh, people with the Me Too, Aziz Ansari, right? Right, right. That was crazy, man. Right? It was, uh, you know, this girl, a woman came out, said these things happen. Other women were like, oh, this doesn't really sound like the Me Too thing. This sounds like a bad date. Right. You yeah. know what I mean? And there was, luckily, there was a uh, another side to the story that was shared. Fortunate for him, man. But there are still people who are concerned about standing next to Aziz Ansari. Oh, I didn't... I've heard this. I've heard that people are like, well, what happened with the Me Too? Because they only see the initial headline, right? Uh, Even with, uh, was it Trey Songs recently, right? Who had these allegations. And And you know what's crazy about all this And then then nothing happens. Nothing happens. But people only saw... The the allegations. The, 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 the The initial allegation, like the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or some valid journalistic driven organization, they cover the story because they do some investigation to confirm what they're writing. That's what they're supposed to do. That's their reputation. So they write these things, whether the Me Too, and they investigate these cases. But then what happens is, because of the nature of the way media is consumed today, specifically in the internet, the source is meaningless. That's what the whole fake news is, Mm -hmm. right? Um, it's 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 great that the president coined 
fake news as he benefited from fake, fake news. news. <laughs> um, but the fake news part is like, who even knows who wrote the Aziz Ansari story? But because you write Aziz Ansari, Me Too, it could be a small publication out of But that's exactly Sacramento. what it was. And then all of a sudden, yeah. boom. It's like Aziz Ansari. So you don't even care anymore when the initial stuff or the things that are of, of grave danger to society were actually investigated by the New York New Yorker magazine and the Wall Street Journal and New York Times and valid publications. And then all of a sudden you have bloggers. I remember, man, fucking Jay-Z, obviously he's smart. He told me like, it must have been 10 years ago. This guy was sitting there watching football. And he says, do you, do you know journalists and bloggers, nobody knows the difference? I'm like, get the fuck out of here. And I'm thinking, like, how could you say that? But as a celebrity, he probably is walking around with something that someone wrote on a blog, and they ask him in real life all the time. Mm -hmm. And he's like, if it was written in the New York Times, they'd ask me with the same frequency. So as I walk around in, in life, whether something was credible or not credible, it doesn't change the way people respond to me. Mm -hmm. And when he said that to me, I was like, man, you're bugging. And I realized that he's completely correct. He's completely correct. It's getting better, right? It's starting to get better. But still, you know, it's in a bad space where most people are, especially with entertainers and things that aren't important to their lives. They're not going to a credible source because they don't give a fuck. No, not at all. They want to get the story quick. Right? They, don't, you're just they want a, to get the clicks. You're a rapper. I like your song. Oh, shit. You got an illegitimate child. Oh, you heard so-and-so got an illegitimate child he's not claiming? Then it's a story, right? Mm -hmm. But that's not fucking true. It's not true. You didn't hear it from a credible source, but they don't care about the credible source. They only care about the fact that Melania Trump and Donald Trump don't get along because they also know a married couple that doesn't get along. So they're just looking for for entertainment value and relatability factor. So here, check this out. We, I'm at, now we're going to talk like it's like we're not even on the air, but we're on the air. <laughs> Where does this go? Like, really play with this. Where does this go? Fame and talent has never been further apart. Okay. They, they're not even, they don't even have a relationship anymore. <laughs> too frequently, most of the time. No. A lot. Fame, in fact, fame there is There are famous people who are talented. I'm not saying that. I'm saying there are way more people that are famous that aren't talented. Yes. Fame is actually way more incentivized than talent today. Not even close. Well, now let me ask you something. Because there are people I have never heard of in my life that I just heard of five minutes ago, and I will go to their Instagram page, and they will have five million followers. That's right. Now, mm -hmm. I don't know if those are real or fake, but people will tell me that person's famous, and I'll be like, I don't know what the fuck it is. They're not famous to me. Yeah. So I, I would, fame is not universal. I would start there. We live in this fragmented society where a celebrity in one world not necessarily a celebrity in another okay, world. Okay, let's, let's not use celebrity. Let's not introduce new words. Okay, fame. Fame. We all know what talent is. Yeah. Right? That's clear. Fame is, do you have a following? Do you have people who listen to you? Do, are you acknowledged by masses of people? And the fact of the matter is, whether it's Instagram or not, if people are paying you for it, you can make a living off of it. That's what this is. And, 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 and with fame just outgrowing the value of talent in today's economy, man, I'm trying to figure out, it's definitely connected to all of these clickbait stories. It's definitely connected to this, oh, this celebrity got a thing. It's, you think Takashi would be beefing with this guy every single day if it wasn't about fame? Yeah, it pays. And, it pays. Let me tell you, it pay, it's all the fucking WWF. Mm -hmm. Right? So it's going like this. I'm trying to figure out, like, where does this go? Where does this end? I think I do see a world that's not quite as known, right, of people who consume music. And I work for Apple Music, and I have a Beats One show, right? So I play music of artists that I've never heard of before that have huge fan bases that ain't in none of this bullshit. 
and they're making incredible music, touring the world, and making you know a great a, living. A great living. Mm-hmm. So I do believe there is a lot of that, and I do believe that it's kind. Of, I look at it like Walmart and you know a boutique restaurant. You mm-hmm. know, or I mean a boutique shop for clothes, right? Um, you know, there's a lot of people who have access to Walmart and you walk in Walmart and people love Walmart, right? It's cheap things. It's shitty things. It's shitty food in some sections. There's a couple of good things in there. It is what it is. Um, but it's not like, you know, uh, Gristides, you know, over here. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. That's really customized for the specific neighborhood that it's in and or a bodega that's a nice bodega in a specific neighborhood or the Amish market or something. You know, I, I look at it like that. I guess is my way to kind of, um, because there's a lot of people who consume a lot of bullshit, fast food, yuck, disgusting shit that I wouldn't consume or like. Mm-hmm. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's not famous or popular or however you want to term it, right? And I think where it goes is the people who don't know the difference continue to consume shit that I would call bullshit. And um, people who don't want to participate have the option because we have this in our hand to go into other worlds and spaces and enjoy music, enjoy content that isn't associated with what everybody has called popular or famous for the moment. You have a point of view on this one? Well, you because I work with kids, right? So when I work with kids, it's really interesting to me when they ask me, who did you have on the show? And whenever I ask them, what are you into? Most of them are super connected to the backpack kid. You know that they, you know the kid who does that dance. Flossing kid who oh, does the dance. They thought it was the the most amazing thing in the world that he was up here. To them, they they don't care about anybody else who's up here. They don't care about any other celebrity. They're asking me about uh, some guy with really bad acne, some white kid who does crazy shit called Supreme Patty. When are you yeah, going to yeah. see him? But when yeah, I tell you the amount of time they the spent, he squeezes lemons in his eyes. Invested, never or like never a, seen it. or like a YouTuber named Jake Paul. Who's I've heard the, of that guy. But you only it's heard great. of him because he, he crossed the line when he went to. He was in Tokyo, went to the suicide park and filmed no, the dead body. No, he did something with Twenty One Savage. They did some. They did some show in Twenty One Savage. I only Savage. heard about him because Zane Lowe's kids are nine and eight, okay. and they was into it. But the amount of time and the 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 connection that they have and that they love, it's. Very scary to me because that to them is fame. That to them is success. Today, though, but guys, when I was 13, 12, and I first was listening to two short albums, and it was like, whoa, these are the tales. The free. And people older than me was like, yo, what are you, what is this bullshit music you listening to, Right. It was me and my friend shit, and it was taboo and dangerous to us or whatever it was. Or we was hanging out in spots we wasn't supposed to be in because we was just seeing, you know, what the drug dealers was doing. And we was looking around the corner being somewhere. As you get older, you either have people around you that start to direct you towards places you are probably healthier being and you start to consume different shit. Or like many of our friends and everybody in this room has them. You have friends that stop learning, growing and evolving and they ended up getting left behind. I, and I think the same yeah, thing yeah. happens on the I, internet. I, I want to believe that. I, I want to believe that. I, I'm in that camp. I believe that it'll correct itself. That it will course correct I, I hope itself. so, because I worry about it. Yeah, but I, you I also, worry about it, too. But you got to factor in, guys. We cannot. And, and I've been in this place. I've been on the, in radio and in media since 1990, right? And I've been in enough research studies and planning and marketing discussions to know that what you never do is base your trajectory for the future on 16-year-olds. Because by the time they're 18, they've changed who they're going to be and the things that are important. And then by the time they're 20, 21, they've changed again, right? Because life and things happen and they learn things and they consume new things and their friends get older and things happen. And and then by the time they're 25, 30 years old, it's, it's another thing. Yeah. Right, you're going to be older way longer than you're going to be younger. So to think that a 12 year old and a 13 year old and what they're into today is going to be what they're into when they're 22, I like cross colors. I look at cross colors now like, yo, what the fuck was I doing? Right? I was in an R&B group and we had our rayon shirts on and our flat tops and all that, and we had our little name. I look at those photos now and I'm like, but there are certain things that stuck with you. Flat top. Look, Steve Stout posted a photo last week. He probably was way. 40 more pounds. He probably looked at that photo like, yo, what was I doing to myself? 
photo. It was a throwback Thursday. You had the slim tie on. You look like Jim, you look like Jimmy Jam or Terry Lewis. I wasn't those. me. Yeah, it was. I'm gonna go to your Instagram right now. You know it was. Don't don't try. You had hair still. I think you had an S curl too. Every my point is everybody has a time in their life yeah. where things course correct. And now you see Steve Stout. Look at him. <laughs> He's in shape, right? Yeah. He has a nicely Relatively. shaped head. Salt and pepper. He's got his look together. I can't grow a hat. Can you grow a uh, hair? Yeah. Absolutely no. not. No. I grow my George Jefferson. <laughs> yes, I mean, I hold on to like a little line. Oh, I thought you, I thought you were going to say absolutely. No, I was no, like, no. this guy, <laughs> absolutely you do that on purpose? Not. Uh, if I could grow hair, I would have. Yo. <laughs> Your shit would be <laughs> 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 Your dreads would be back. I'd be back. Yeah, Your dreads back. Locks, man. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me up here. Nah, it's, it's great, always man. a pleasure, man. That's great, man. And do you believe um, that uh, where we are in advertising and business right now, uh, corporate America, do you believe that they are embracing the tanning of America or what we're seeing with Trumpisms and MAGA maniacs is well, a no, no. is 100% a pushback of fear that America and the world is becoming browner? Check this out. It's... To your point about um, audiences and the internet, before the internet sort of got accessible to all, those groups existed. We just didn't tap into them. We didn't know. We couldn't connect. We couldn't connect. So it was fine because they were in these rural places. Look, what the fuck is cults? I always said to my, what, what a cult is basically a failed religion. It's mm. a startup. That didn't make it. <laughs> That's yeah. all a cult is. You know, whether you, and like, and you call it a cult because it didn't make it big. Like, that's just what it is. I mean, why isn't the Catholic religion a cult mm. that just went all the way? Because it's popping out. Because it's popping. So these sectors of beliefs and this and racism, you look around the world. First of all, a few things, let's just get in place. These Any first world country was built on the back of slavery, mm -hmm. free labor. That's an ingredient to be a first world nation. Right. One would argue Israel, okay, that you could look at that. But they have migrant people you, there. You, you could go back and forth on that people did work The in bottom Israel. line is these first world countries, all of them were built, America, Russia, thing, China, thing, free labor, period. So it's not like that's a foreign concept of slavery and enslaving people to build a nation. The second thing is, when those countries have civil wars, there's always these civil wars. You look back in the history books, these countries going through civil The loser gets killed or thrown out the country. They just, you read about China, they murdered all these people. You read about it. Of course. They, they lost the war. That was one faction who believed one thing, and the communists believed something else, and they lost. And That's what we're doing now. And it's, and you do, and... As evidenced by the fact that you're dead. <laughs> yeah. This is what we're doing because none of you guys are alive, right? right? In America, they lose the Civil War. What happens? Oh, shit. Okay, free them. It doesn't change your point of view. It doesn't change your perspective. You didn't kill anybody. You didn't throw them out the country. They were always racist. They were... They put up more statues in the they, 20s. They go they make sure the flag was flying high. They were always racist. And you think and you hope that they would grow and they would change. Like, man, I'm fucking 40 years old and this guy is a fucking nigga. I'm 60 years old. You think I'm going to look at him as like an accomplished black guy now? I'm already set in my ways. That's how I believe. That's how I raise my kids. I'm not fucking with you. That's a fact. And that's generational. It's unfortunate. And we know all the things that are generational to us. If you grew up from a family that looked at black people or immigrants as less than, that's generational and that'll be passed on. It's just one of those things. Whether we like unless it or not. Unless somebody breaks the cycle. Unless somebody right? breaks it. But as we know in families, somebody breaking the cycle is far and few in between. We all know that in this room. Takes, it's an outlier who does that. And even as an outlier, you can change your family, but not your entire family. You can change your household, not the fam, not the last name, right? So unfortunately, that's the case, bro. And in America, they never threw these people out. So of course they're going to... 
hiding in pockets. And as African Americans and immigrants and, and Chinese and everybody grew, they become smaller and smaller in their influence. But the fact of the matter is they still exist. And that's the real, and, and now with the internet, and now with a president who's igniting this voice again, they have a, uh, they have a platform. They have, they have a platform and a person who actually represents their values and speaks to their values and speaks out of both sides of his mouth to not piss them off, but to definitely keep them close, like the whole thing in, in, Charlottesville, in Charlottesville was on both sides, right. and that type of bullshit, like really. But the fact of the matter is how I feel about it is that it never, it, it always was present. It's omnipresent. And they they were stifled for a bit, and now they got their voice, and now they're running around with the using the internet and fake news and real news and Fox News to basically share their point of view. And it's something that we now have to deal with, but it was always there. That's the point we need to... Man, when I look at all these cops getting killed, and Kaepernick's a man... By the way, it was your early support of Kaepernick. That was fucking, that was ace, man. I got to know the dude, man. It's fucking awesome. Yeah, man. The, the, when all these cops, was, all these guys were getting shot, I was sitting there thinking the entire time, could you imagine what was happening when there was no cameras? Fam. Right. Oh, we talked about that God. so much. We talked about that it so much. It must have been happening 50 times a day. Yes. Yes. But at least. Way more. Way more. Yo, so Asada Shakur, right, who escape prison and with you know in black panthers in the day and you know she's still wanted by the federal government mm -hmm. cuba will not yeah. you boom that yeah. whole thing i had to go yo with everything that's going on right now with cops can you imagine what was happening to asada shakur and black panthers and tupac's mom and the panther 21 here in new york city and corrupt cops that we're hearing about in new york city right can you imagine the things they was trying to do to the, them the, then the corrupt cops are saying it right now they're these are documentaries on these guys yes running around they're like man these these guys are making more money than us let's frame them let's set them up let's steal from them it's crazy. It was happening. You know what? I fucked that up. It ain't 50 times a day. It was happening nonstop. All over. There was corruption happening. Corruption. Taking advantage. Coercing. Killing. Setting up. Murdering. Kidnapping. Black people. Immigrants. Nonstop. And the fact that there's, the fact that there's cameras even taping this. The Rodney King thing. No one even believed that shit until they seen it. That's right. Everybody was saying it. It was like, what are you talking about? NWA, you're wrong. Yep. These guys are wrong. Fuck Don't the fuck police. Fuck the police. How fuck could you? Ice-T, cop killer. Take that off the record store. That, ban that album. Yes. Mm -hmm. These guys are making up bullshit. Somebody motherfucking tapes this. Now, all of a sudden, everybody has to deal with it. And Dre and all these guys are like, I told y'all already. This ain't even new to us. And guys in California was like, this is normal. What are you guys talking about? You're making a big deal out of this. We used to watch this all the time. Then I go to, um, when I think about that, it's like, it's so fucked up. And it was happening so much in the black community. And like, black people who could do something about it didn't do shit. That's why I applaud Kaepernick and LeBron for their yeah. willing to stand up, and Durant, and Chris Paul, and Melo, and D. Wade, for being any NBA overall, for allowing the athletes to be up, stand up and say some shit. Because you look at those guys back then, like, the motherfucking Rodney King gets his ass whipped, and nobody puts a camera and asks Magic Johnson what he thinks. Mm. How to find one interview on Magic Johnson talking about Rodney King. It happened right there in Los Angeles, bro. That's how fucked up it is and was and is. Well, and that's why people are so uncomfortable now where you have athletes, you have media people, you have uh, that are not politicians, right, using their platform to say, no, I have a, I have a higher expectation of our country and I'm not going to be a citizen in a place where this shit is okay. And I'm not afraid to lose money to speak the truth. We talked about that earlier, and this we've been talking for a while, but we saw about media and um, advertisers and people not doing things in order to lose money. Like, 
You look at what Kaepernick is doing. You look at what LeBron is doing. They're putting their popularity on the line. They're That's right. Sales in order to, to say what's right. It, and, and I think we have to do that. We That is an obligation. As an American, you have that right, and that is an obligation. And if you think about it, because you're thinking about money that's going to come from it or who you're going to piss off, you're certainly doing yourself, your family, what you believe in, a disservice. Well, you're doing a disservice to what the ideal and the idea is supposed to be. You're a liar, basically. Like, if you live in America or a country that is supposedly one that is uh, accepting of different people and different ways of life, and that was the idea, and now you're not accepting, right? That in itself is, a, is problematic. You're a liar. You're a hypocrite and a liar, straight up and down. And it shouldn't, it's not really much more complicated than that, right? And, I, and I, we talk about it on the air all the time. I'll, I'll, I'll say, hey, Americans are liars and they're comfortable with it. If you're okay with this over here, you are saying that you're comfortable with your country being 100% a farce because this country went to the world and said, come here. Come here and be, as long as you ain't hurting nobody, be whatever you want. Yeah, and That'd we did, and, and we did, and, and this country, this country did exactly what this country said it was going to do from day one. This country came in, stole, robbed, mm -hmm. cheated, lied. Yeah. Right? Enslaved. That's the same thing they ran from. Yep. That's what they ran from. They came here. Running from that. They came here and they did that. And we expect a different outcome because we've been lied to. We've been lied to. History has lied to us. Propaganda has lied to us. But it takes you just a second to go behind the veneer and you see what this really is. You see what they did in, 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 in actually all over the country, but primarily in, in California when... After the in, uh, they bombed um, Pearl Harbor, they just oh yeah, they put in, in camps. <laughs> just put Japanese people Japanese in camps, camps, knocked on doors. We were yeah. just talking doors, about that, right? yeah. So, did it surprise you when they wouldn't let people in the country that day? When the president said, "No, nope, you were on a flight," and they're like, "Nope, you can't land." Yeah. yeah, it's the same shit. It's the same shit. What's the policy? The policy is we decide who we want to actually put the focus on, and we put the focus on them, all bets are off. This ain't America no more. This is every country that we criticize. It's facts, man. Steve right. Stout, ladies and gentlemen, yes. give it up for him one time. Thank you, man. Thank you.